it's important to uh, go back and review what commercial fertilizers are not allowed in organic production. So, for example, ammonium sulfate is not allowed. Both of the MAP and DAP phosphate fertilizers, potassium chloride, calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate, urea, liquid ammonium phosphate, they are not allowed in organic. Now, if you if you're have a more fluid uh, way of thinking of things and integrating stuff into your toolbox, if you're working under the sustainable umbrella or the eco-agriculture umbrella, for example, calcium nitrate is popular in eco-agriculture and so is liquid ammonium phosphate and so is MAP and ammonium, so ammonium sulfate. But eco-agriculture does have this kind of idea of some things that would not be used and for example, they, they avoid DAP, they avoid potassium chloride, for example, and, and, and so forth. Uh, for uh, your calcium magnesium, you do have a lot of tools. So these are allowed. You can use calcitic limestone, dolomitic limestone, gypsum. Uh, you know, if it's a mine source of gypsum, not the, not the wallboard kind. Uh, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Also K-mag, also known as sopomag, that's a, that's a source of magnesium. It also applies potassium. On phosphorus, you can use rock phosphate. You can use hard rock phosphate, soft rock phosphate, bone meal, bat guano, meat and bone meal. Uh, for potassium, you can use potassium sulfate. That's a mine source. And you can actually get this in a very ultra-fine kind of um, uh, ground material that you can solubilize and, and inject into fertigation. And I've worked with growers that do that. Um, also the K-mag and the sopomag and the kelp meal. Uh, rock phosphate, just as an example. So uh, part of this gets into how you're gonna, how you're gonna get this, how you're gonna get a hold of it. So the Ozark Organic Growers would, since it was a cooperative uh, growers association, they would put together, uh, put out a list every year and say, what do you need? And so for example, we did this. We ordered a 22 ton semi-trailer out of Florida, brought up the soft rock phosphate and they did drop delivery to farms. So they would come by our farm and drop seven tons. They would go to the next farm and drop th five tons or three tons or whatever. So that way you need, you need to get these wholesale prices, not the retail prices on these products, okay? That's the point. Uh, on nitrogen, you got, you got a lot of uh, materials, feather meal, cottonseed meal, alfalfa meal, and then a whole a series of things that are pelletized uh, in composted poultry litter. Nature Safe, Mighty Grow, Harmony are three popular ones and I, and I really feel confident they would do a good job for you. Uh, compost and then fish hydrosylate. A lot of people talk about fish emulsion but this is actually the more more practical and more widely used um, uh, version of the liquid fish. And then on sulfur and trace elements, when uh, Adam was talking about sulfur, that's ag sulfur. It's 90% sulfur, it's elemental sulfur. So, and you can, you can based on a soil test, uh, and there is plenty of extension in, uh, information that you can nail the pH just by amending the soil with the, with the sulfur, letting it activate in the soil for a few months or maybe a year, and then plant. And you can also dribble a little bit on every year to keep the pH down. Uh, I've been on blueberry farms where they have, um, uh, you know, acid, you know, injections into, into the drip to keep the pH down. Um, so there is a form of acetic acid that's 30%, very strong industrial strength. That's a possibility uh, to keep the pH down in drip. So let's see, also iron sulfate, all your trace elements, if they're in a sulfate form, they're allowed in organic. So you really have all the tools you need. The, probably the biggest issue in organic is you're starting off with a low phosphorus um, soil test. That's challenging to bring up quickly. And so the point is you don't bring it up quickly. You're not going to make that all in one year. But uh, you can slowly build it up and it'll all work. And I've worked on, I've worked with a farm in Texas, 150 acre organic vegetable farm. They've been using compost at 10 tons per acre and they use meat and bone meal. And we, we're watching that pH come back up onto the soil test where we really want it, okay? Now, uh, Adam mentioned this, but I want to reemphasize these two sources. 
Now, if you're, if you're doing research and you're trying to figure out what's what, this is where to go, okay? You go to the OMRI webpage, the Organic Materials Review Institute, uh, and you go to the Washington State Department of Agriculture. The reason is they both publish extensive directories and databases of allowed products for the use in certified organic production. So if it's a crop input for soil fertility, or for pest control, or for weed control, and um, there's a manufacturer that has put a product on the market, and they have gone to OMRI, they have submitted like the secret trade secret information of how that material was formulated and manufactured, and they got, they got a technical uh, specialist who reviewed that information under confidentiality. They uh, allowed them to put the OMRI label on that product. And as a farmer, that's fantastic because now you, it simplifies your life because all you have to do is you go, uh, my products are listed with OMRI or my products are listed with WSDA. And then when you're doing your paperwork and you sit that, submit that to KDA, boom, you're done. Now, uh, so this, again, for research purposes and to manage your farm records and, and make everything work, two really good sources. Now, this is not to say that every single product has to have one of these labels on there before it is allowed in organic. There are exceptions. There are certain products where the manufacturer goes, you know what, I do not want to deal with that bureaucracy, and, and uh, they, I've been burned already. So I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to send them my trade secrets. And since I work in the field uh, and been doing this for years, I've actually seen trade secrets that came through uh, submitted paperwork that wasn't supposed to be there. And it was great. I was like, hey, this is how this works. So, um, so anyways, that, so if you, if you encounter that, you can get a manufacturer's letter uh, statement of, of, of allowed use. And then you submit that back to, to the certifier, et cetera. So next, okay. So next thing is, is your research toolbox. How are you gonna find out where to get these things? So, here are some key sources. Uh, and, and in fact, our farm, which uh, we do both, like I said, we do both conventional research and organic research and production on our, on our farm. We have an actual working farm there that students come and work on and produce vegetables and sell to the campus. Uh, so, so we actually uh, get a lot of materials. This is, again, this is kind of wholesale prices and regional. Now, there are other suppliers. I know suppliers, a big supplier in Texas. There's a big supplier in California. There's a big supplier in Maine. But you, then you're dealing with shipping costs, okay? So I'm just giving you a couple regional contacts. So Seven Springs Farm in Virginia and Lancaster Ag Products in Pennsylvania. Uh, they, that's kind of like a catalog of everything. So you can get that online or you can get a print version. You can look through there, see what they have, see what the prices are, see how that can plug into what you need uh, and, and manage your farm. So, and then also uh, because um, it's based in Kentucky and it is a widely used organic fertilizer is Nature Safe. Um, and Nature Safe um, comes out of Griffin Industries. It's a byproduct of meat and, uh, you know, the animal processing, feather meal and all this other stuff. It's all made into a fertilizer and it's pelletized. You can buy it in a 50 pound bag, you can get it by the pallet, you put it out at a certain pounds per acre and you can nail the amount of nitrogen applied per acre with this kind of material. Uh, and, and so the other one is, um, I'll mention another source is Mighty Grow. It's an outfit in Alabama that is doing a really smash up job on making a pelletized poultry litter. It, it is also additionally amended with microbial inoculants so it, you have a really good growth response. Okay, so, and here's an example. Here's, an, here's, here's one on, on Nature Safe. If I'm doing, when we do organic production, and we want, and, and just as a, as a kind of a, a reference point, uh, at least for, for vegetable production, we are aiming for 75 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, so on fruits, crops, it's more often more like 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, but when, so if you do that and you want 75 pounds of nitrogen per acre, it's 10% nitrogen. You make that, you make that uh, 
you know, mathematics come out, and that's how many pounds you're applying. So you're putting out like 800, 900 pounds of material per acre to make, to make, get that crop up to speed. Now on this one, it has, this is like a 10, 2, 8. This is like a 4, 3, 1, 4, 3, 2. It has a lower analysis. If you calculate that out, you're going to have to put on like 1,600 pounds per acre. But here's the thing, you don't do that. On some of these things, and you, 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 you do the analysis and calculation, and some things you do what, I do what I call is an agronomic application rate because the cost is too much. And here's the reason why. If you went with 600 pounds of this material per acre or 1,000 pounds of this material per acre, you'll have a growth response that is equivalent to 75 or 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And the reason is, when you're dealing with uh, commercial fertilizers, and, and, and especially the, the regular commercial fertilizers, you're dealing with the NPK analysis, and that's it. When you have organic materials, like these, these pelletized uh, poultry litters and these composts and things, you have an analysis, yes, a chemical analysis, but you have all this organic stuff, okay? This organic stuff is full of material that feeds the soil food web that stimulates the soil and makes all these nutrients available. So their growth response is similar, if that helps put it into, into perspective. Here's some steps to organic fertility. Um, and this is a real quick uh, list because uh, John Strang has already reviewed uh, good uh, management of blueberries. But if you're going to aim for organic production, here are the quick steps. One is your soil test and adjust for pH. And my, my way of thinking of pH is between 4.8 and 5.5 for blueberries. On the base saturation, uh, because blueberries are, are more of a magnesium lover, you want the, the calcium saturation to be 60% and magnesium to be 20%. Um, I do recommend soft rock phosphate for sweetness and for quality. It's often said in the extension literature that blueberries don't require a lot of phosphorus, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to add some phosphorus <clears throat> for the quality and the sweetness of the berry. And in eco-agriculture, we always test for the BRICS content. And every farmer is going to have a BRICS meter, a refractometer, and they're going to be testing that fruit and we're gonna be aiming to increase that quality of the fruit all the time. Um, there is a mycorrhizae dip uh, inoculant that is available specifically for blueberries. It's an aerocoid type of mycorrhizae. This is the symbiotic fungi that forms an association with the plant root, and uh, some kinds of, of mycorrhizae go into the plant root as endo, and some of them are outside the root as ecto. The fascinating thing about this is that the ecto kind of mycorrhizae you can see with the naked eye and especially with the hand lens, like oaks and pines and things like that, and I think blueberries are the same way. So, but that is, it's got an asterisk on there because um, it's not widely available. There's one outfit, Horticultural Alliance in Florida that has it some years. Uh, but if you're organic, you want that in your toolbox. Whether you use it or not, you want to know about it and, and explore it, maybe use it, maybe not. Okay, on nitrogen, on the Atra publication that we described, we did, uh, we used feather meal, one cup per plant at, uh, just before bud break, and then one cup again uh, six weeks later. Uh, we also did a thing where we would do half and half of feather meal and cottonseed meal. The reason is feather meal has got 12% nitrogen and it's fast release. Uh, cottonseed meal is 7% nitrogen and it's slower release. So you, you, you get them together and they kind of like really keep the crop going. So uh, on a bearing crop, on a young crop, it's just the bud break. On a bearing crop, you do the additional uh, 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 supplementation six weeks later. It's really to keep the whole energy of the plant up and producing. Um, so that's the choice or use one of the bagged pelletized products. For example, the Nature Safe or the Harmony or the Mighty Grow. And so uh, that's the nitrogen program. And then in addition, it's popular in organic and eco-agriculture to do foliar feeding and fertigation. Uh, this fish hydrolysate, like I mentioned, is soluble. It can be injected. 
can be sprayed. And it's common when you're doing foliar feeding to, to it's a real classic blend. And there's some, a lot of synergy between this is to blend fish and seaweed together. Uh, and microbials can include compost teas or, or purchased microbial inoculants. Uh, you can also, when you're doing, your, you can add all this in when you're doing your pest control. You can be an all-in-one, okay? 